Okay, I'm sure that a lot of you are sick of American political videos, and I wanted to run away from it for a couple hours, and I watched the Cowboys choke in overtime to the Texans. So we're back to politics, but in Brazil, unfortunately. Fucking Jason Garrett. In any case, uh, it is a new day for Brazil, uh, and... Here we see people with these faces of ecstasy after voting for a guy who basically, um, I, I think the the leftists are calling like like S Southern Hemisphere Hitler or something. So they have like a live blog over here and it says Jair Bolsonaro has won a resounding victory in the Brazilian presidential election, securing far more of the vote than he was predicted to. Bolsonaro got 49 million votes on Sunday, 46% of the total, compared to Fernando Adadje's Workers' Party, the PT, which won just 29% or 31 million votes. However, to uh, Bolsonaro's total was just shy of the majority he needed for an outright win, meaning a second round of voting will occur on October 28th, which will see Bolsonaro and Adadje fa face off to become president. Bolsonaro did not appear at a scheduled press conference due to health reasons, but in a Facebook live broadcast, he declared to unite the nation. Bolsonaro and followers have <laughs> declared fraud and faulty electronic systems were a factor in today's election, saying if there hadn't been issues with the voting system, we would have we had already have decided the name of the future president. And Bolsonaro's PSL party president said the PSL had won 52 seats in the lower house making it the second biggest party and giving it a high capacity to govern Brazil. So th this is a big concern for if, if you, you know, are talking about forming a government. Remember that Brazil has a massive multi-party system where, you know, you, you kind of have to govern sometimes through coalition, which isn't the best system, to be honest with you. Uh, Fernando Adagi is now the only man who can stop Bolsonaro from becoming president, although he faces a battle some commentators have suggested is almost impossible. Araji hinted at some kind of second round alliance, saying he had already spoken to three of the other candidates, Morita Silva, Ciro Gomes, and Guillerme Bulos. So this is this is the score. I mean, I guess this is the score at the moment, 46% to 29%. And they have basically flipped the script because I'll show you some of the previous results. Uh, I don't know if we can get the presidential map here because I don't know if they published that today. And also, I can believe that it would be a little difficult to do it today. But in any case, you had, um, you know, basically Bolsonaro up against a massive flanks of, of uh, different parties. Some of them you know, leftists, some of them more liberal. You have the Workers' Party, which has ruled the country for much of the past 10, 15 years, and the Communist Party as their allies. So they, they gained 29% of the vote, which is actually a, a step down for them. Uh, Shiro Gomez, which is a little more of a socialist party, they, they only earned about 12.5%, which uh, I guess is respectable considering they don't have as much strength in terms of infrastructure and then you have a bunch of new part i mean you have the new party which is a little more of a uh what do you call them uh libertarian party and their leader is joe amoedo and they actually gained two and a half seats and perhaps a little you know the, the question will be which of these parties is going to gain any representation in the in the new congress if uh, the new, you know, because some of these parties are well established, some of them are, are not as much. You have, um, and some of these other parties aren't that important. This this was the hard left party led by Guillermo Castro Bulos, and his party won 0.6% of the vote. That that was a party that, that uh, by the way, Glenn Greenwald and his, his uh, husband support over in Brazil. Uh, n not so well. I mean, I, I, guess, I guess maybe the the Brazilians have had enough of your medicine, you commie frauds, and they want they they want something else. 
They want like actually a system that will allow them to uh, do whatever the fuck they want. I mean, that's a concept. Uh, some people, some people appreciate that. Um, this was 2014. This was with uh, Dilma, who was the president who was impeached last time. So this was the second round result, 51 to 48. And in the first round, so she wasn't she wasn't earning quite as much as, and this was her running for re-election. She was earning quite quite as much as Bolsonaro was earning um, during these these election polls. But she did uh, <laughs> she did lose. I mean, she did she didn't win. She went she won by a very substantial margin at the time. And uh, then Bolsonaro wasn't even a candidate. But in the second round, she only won by about 3 million votes, which is respectable, 51 to 48 margin. In the first, in the first round, she'd won by 8 points. Bolsonaro has won by 18 points. So it's a wider margin than the last one. But you can go to 2010, which was her first time running for, for office, and she did win. Those of you that don't know, she won by a 14-point margin, which was very nice, and then won by a 13-point margin in the first, in the second round. Lula, of course, in his first election, you can see he he basically destroyed Jose Serra, who was the first, he was the he was the second place person, um, and in the first round he he doubled him up. 46 to 23, but still not as good as Bolsonaro in this election. And in the second round, he won 61 to 38. Very impressive. I have to say, you know, so, some of these results are, but nobody has yet been able to clear the hurdle of winning an election outright in the first round. Uh, in 20, 2006, <coughs> much of the opposition joined together to fight Lula, and they, they were able to earn 41% in the first round. And then Lula just beat them again, you know, 60 to 39, which, is, again, it's impressive. I have a feeling that this will be the flipping of the script on leftism in Latin America. You see, and, and, and by, by uh, extension beyond Latin America, possibly here to the U.S., although it might be a little more difficult for people to process since they can't even figure out what genitals they uh, match which gender. Um, I'll, I'll explain this, okay? Those are countries that actually have a long tradition of believing in social democracy and in the need for deep state intervention into the economy. And now that the largest economic power in Latin America, which is Brazil, is effectively showing that even if it doesn't, like let's say the the world falls apart and and uh, Bolsonaro can't pull it out in the second round, which could happen. You know things happen. Uh, he he's talking about rigging. I don't know. It could be that he just fucks up or something, or he he you know turns into a giant, uh, you know some sort some one of those uh, uh, bug creatures from Starship Troopers and blows the election or something, right? So it could be that he loses. It doesn't matter because effectively Brazil is is kind of sailing away from the ship of, of uh, democratic socialism slash social democracy. And people, people behave as if those are very, very different concepts. And they're, they're only, you know, different shades of the same color. Okay, that's, that's what I'd like to say. You know, social democracy, yes, it is a thing. It is a little bit distinct from, social, from democratic socialism because it, it, it has a commitment to parliamentary democracy as, as a permanent system. As a, democratic socialism, I think, eventually seeks to replace the parliamentary system and, free, and, and, and you know, open democracy with, with what's more commonly known as popular democracy and, you know, devolving it to popular councils usually which end up not really having any influence in, in practice. But that, that's the concept, at least. In Brazil, it's been a colossal failure, whatever you want to call it, whether it's social democracy or democratic socialism. This is a country. Do I have to remind you 
where there were World Cup riots because the socialist government was knocking down people's slum homes in order to in, in order to build fucking so soccer stadiums. So let, let, let's let's take a look at some of these. Um, well, sorry, I mean some of these are from France. So I, I guess you know anywhere you put the World Cup. First, I guess it's the World Cup curse. It can't be that immigration and socialism fuck countries up. But um, this is from Vice News. So here. <laughs> We're coming off of a year of the biggest protest Brazil's ever seen, some of the most aggressive. We've got corruption, financial waste. All of the soccer hooligans are coming to descend on Brazil as well. We've got a pissed off population. It seems like a very, very large powder keg. Yeah. In 2007, FIFA chose Brazil to host the World Cup. Brazil. It seemed like a brilliant idea, hosting the World Cup in the most football fanatic country on the planet. Little did they expect that it would become the focus of some of the largest protests Brazil has seen in decades. This mass civil uprising began in June of 2013, and it surprised even the most jaded Brazilians. Hundreds of thousands of people paralyzed cities across the country over a 20 cent increase in bus fares. The police response was brutal in the beginning. Elite military police units. Oh, police brutality in a democratic socialist country? I would have never thought. Trained to pacify Rio slums were brought to quell demonstrators. But the police violent. Oh, militarized police in a democratic socialist country? Who would have predicted it? And drove more people into the streets. <laughs> For the first time anyone can recall, the people began to lose their fear of the police. The protests have been remarkable for another reason. The public outrage bridged wide class differences in Brazil. Rio's college-educated kids are fighting side-by-side side with hardened protesters from the favela, who've borne the brunt of Brazil's brutal police force. Thanks to the World Cup, they now have a common enemy, FIFA, the world governing... So, so you have this socialist president here in the middle, uh, you can't see right here. Well, I mean, my cursor isn't really working that well, but body of football and the unbridled capitalism that it represents. In exchange for hosting the World Cup, FIFA demanded upgrades to Brazil's infrastructure and internal security that has ballooned into the most expensive in football history, some $15 billion. The government insists all of this spending is worth it. Nós temos exército, marinha, aeronáutica, a nossa polícia militar, a polícia civil, a polícia federal, mais de 20 mil homens agregados para dar toda segurança e conforto para aqueles que virão a Copa do Mundo. But the past year has shown that the population is fed up. So the, in my opinion, that's one of the reasons that the, you know, the, the previous government of Rousseff kind of uh, shat the bed. It, it wasn't just a World Cup, by the way. It was the Olympics, too. So they did the same thing twice, screwed over the people. Remember, there was a whole Ryan Lochte thing. Br Brazilians, look, Brazil is a very interesting country. Uh, we had Revan Starkiller, one of the Brazilian residents who watched. I think we have maybe one or two people who watch the show from Brazil, and he's one of them. And... Um, you know, he's describing how people in Brazil basically have zero trust in the political system, even even by comparison to this country. They, ha they have one president who's been convicted of all sorts of felonies and, and bribery cases, which is Lula, who um, I think we showed over here. That's him. And then you have uh, another one who has been basically, uh, you know, she, she might end up getting indicted as well. This is Dilma, who looks like Ursula from The Little Mermaid. And then their current president is also some sort of uh, degenerate criminal, Michel Temer. So that's the country that has produced this desire for change, and they might get it with this Bolsonaro guy. Now, if he comes into office, 
I don't know if everything's going to be good. I, I, unfortunately, I think he might continue some of the populist economic policies of his predecessors. And I, I don't know if it's really going to help. I don't know if there really is a politician that can get Brazil back into order. It's not exactly a country that is uniform. Every part of the country has kind of a different type of character. You know, you have the Amazon regions, you have the southeast, which is more urban and developed and, and a lot of industrial zones. You have a lot of uh, social stratification, you know, a lot of very rich areas surrounded by much poorer areas. You also have a lot of ranch country over in the far south. Uh, it's a very interesting country. It's not an easy country to run. I understand why so many people screw up at it. Uh, but <laughs> I guess it's because of that that they end up being corrupt pieces of crap. Uh, that's about it. Um, I actually would say, you know, not going to beat around the bush. I'd rather this guy win than another loser from the Workers' Party, which has basically run the country into the ground for over a decade. But it's not my choice. So uh, until then, uh, muito obrigado, Brazil. Uh, thank you very much for uh, voting for this guy. And, and basically, I, I heard he, he says a lot of like really crazy shit. So, you know, maybe we're in for some funny news from him, uh, you know, Duterte style. Good night. And plus, uh, please subscribe to this video, like the video, uh, subscribe to the channel, like the video, uh, comment on the video, and subscribe to my other channel, uh, Razor Ray Live Wounds, and also share this video. Hasta la vista.